In the 1800s, democracy was spreading and expanding across America, but at the same time, so too was its opposite, slavery. As cotton became the cash crop of the world, it had terrible consequences for the enslaved black people across the South. But just how did slavery change and transform at this time? Well, that's the story that we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Little Humans. Before we get going, I just want to remind teachers and homeschool parents that there are lesson plans and resources that go with this episode on my website, historyforhumans.com. And now, our exploration question is, how did slavery and the lives of enslaved people change during the antebellum era? And antebellum refers to the decades before the Civil War from like the 1820s through the 1850s. And this is going to be a heavy one, where we look into one of, if not the darkest aspects of American history. But as it's a central part of our country's history, we need to face it in order to learn from it. And now, onward to the past. American slavery dates back to its colonial origins. However, after the American Revolution, there were signs that it was on its way out. With the ideals of the American Revolution, northern states all moved to end slavery. It was also prohibited in the open lands of the Old Northwest, and it was becoming less and less profitable in the South. Even many slave owners like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson hoped that slavery would die a natural death, so to speak. But this all changed with the invention of the cotton gin. In 1793, Eli Whitney devised a simple hand-powered machine that separated the seeds from the cotton fiber called the cotton engine, or gin. It was 50 times more efficient than painstakingly separating it by hand, which meant 50 times more profitable. Far from dying a natural death, Whitney's gin pumped new life into slavery, and the South grew increasingly dependent on it. And that brings us to our quiz flash from the past. What percentage of Southerners do you guess owned slaves? 15%, 25, 60, or 80? The answer is B. Only 25% held slaves because most people in the South could not afford to purchase an enslaved person. It was a huge expensive business, slave trading, a huge revolting business. But even if most white Southerners could not afford to purchase slaves, many still aspired to. It was part of what it meant to be successful in the South. Due to the cotton gin, slavery spread throughout the states of the Deep South in what was known as the Cotton Belt, which swept from South Carolina all the way to Texas. And while the North prohibited slavery, they too relied on it for their cotton. Textile mills across the North and in Europe also raked in huge profits off the lashed and scarred backs of enslaved labor. The saying went that enslaved people worked from sunup to sundown, from cradle to grave, six or for some, seven days a week. But the lives of individual enslaved black people differed greatly. Some toiled and lived on large plantations, while most worked on much smaller ones. The majority at this time worked in the fields under the watchful eyes and cracking whip of the overseer who managed the plantation and enforced an often brutal discipline. Other enslaved people performed more skilled jobs like blacksmithing and carpentry, while others worked as cooks or servants in the home. And there, enslaved women faced the additional terror of sexual abuse. Most lived in crude one-room shacks and slept right on the floors. Because of this and the fact that their diets barely sustained them, disease was rampant and could sometimes wipe out entire families. 
and there were actually a considerable number of free black people as well. By 1860, there were 250,000 free black people in the South, and about that number in the North as well. Most were either freed by their owners, often in their wills, or they worked in their limited free time to earn extra money and then purchase their freedom. But still, they weren't quite free. They were prohibited from voting, of course, from getting an education, and they were blocked from many jobs. Still yet, free black communities emerged in several southern cities where they often relied on each other. Despite the oppression and daily hardships, enslaved people fought to retain their dignity. Even though Southern laws did not recognize their marriages, they still formed families and this became an essential part of their survival. However, at any moment, they still knew that their families could be sold off and never seen again. And throughout the South, a unique Black culture emerged, a blending of various African cultures and traditions with customs from America. This can best be seen in their music and religious practices. Music gave them an outlet to express their sorrow, hardships, and the limited joys they had. They played instruments like the banjo, fiddle, percussions, while others clapped, stomped, and sang along. The unique rhythms birthed the first truly American music that would later lead to jazz and blues and the Christian religion also became central to many of their lives. They latched on to biblical stories of redemption, God's justice, and escaping slavery. They often sung black spirituals, which were folk songs that mixed Christian teachings and their own experiences in bondage. The abolitionist Frederick Douglass recalled his memories of hearing these spirituals. Enslaved people would make the dense old woods for miles around reverberate with their wild songs, revealing at once the highest joy and the deepest sadness. They would compose and sing as they went along, consulting neither time nor tune. They told a tale of woe. They breathed the prayer and complaint of souls boiling over with the bitterest anguish. Every tone was a testimony against slavery and a prayer to God for deliverance from chains. And it's no wonder that all enslaved people found little ways to fight back. The enslaved black people in America did not just go along with the oppressive system they were trapped in. They found numerous means of resisting and fighting back. The most common form of resistance was simply to slow down work as much as possible. Others would damage or sabotage equipment and supplies. The ultimate act of defiance was escaping to freedom in the North. The Underground Railroad developed at this time and led thousands to freedom with the help of black and white abolitionists. Lastly, there were the occasional slave rebellions and uprisings. Nat Turner's rebellion took place in 1831 in Virginia. Turner was an enslaved mystical preacher who claimed to receive visions, and one of these visions inspired his uprising seeking to free the enslaved people in the country. Turner and a band of supporters killed 57 people, mostly women and children, before the uprising was put down and they were hanged. But it sent shockwaves of terror across the white south and led to increased slave codes, stripping the enslaved people of the little independence or education that they had. And it also put an abrupt end in Virginia to any talk about ending slavery. It's gonna take a civil war to do that. And that is a story for another time. But before we go, I just wanna share one last quote with you. The minister James Pennington remembered, there is one sin that slavery committed against me, which I will never forgive. It robbed me of my education. You see, education is in itself liberating. And that is why it's so important that we take the time to remember this history. Because history is the light that guides us forward. 
So thanks for learning some today. This has been History for Little Humans. <laughs>